Hello and welcome to our video series on Tech for Good. In this series we'll be chatting to values led business owners and discuss what Tech for Good means to them. Enjoy! Here we are uh, with Gavin Neat uh, from Neatbox. Uh, he is my second guest on this quest for uncovering and talking about uh, Tech for Good. Um, so we're just going to begin. Gavin, do you maybe want to give yourself a, a slightly better introduction than what I've just done? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, so um, you could call it an interview, but the truth is that if we were, if this wasn't lockdown, we'd be meeting up and we'd be having a pint and we'd be having a yes. chat. And that's what this is. Uh, this just feels like I'm, have you, right, seriously, man, this is not cool. <laughs> I, I was looking, I looked at my fridge and I thought, have I got any beer? I haven't got any beer. Yeah. I wanted to have a beer. I've had a long day today and I thought, I'm mm -hmm. looking across, I've got some decent whiskeys over here and I'm thinking... It's Josh. Yeah, I know. It's, it's only 10 I past. Appreciate that. There's a whiskey. I, I've got some rum. I mean, it, I yeah. can make a hell of a cocktail with what I've got, yeah. uh, but I might not get through <laughs> half an hour. So yeah. uh, I think the question was, who am I? Um, yeah. Uh, rather than Why are you here? <laughs> rubbish. Why am I here? What am I doing? Yeah. Uh, well, the reason I'm here is because a few years ago now, I was um, looking for a developer to try and help me come up with a solution and i just i was desperate to find a developer who had real public good in them they were trying to change the world as a company that was doing something that there was quite a few developers around and i wanted to find one that actually at their core had and i'm bigging you up here man yeah this <laughs> it's just me but, but the, truth, <laughs> the, the, the truth is that's why i'm here i'm here because you know me because i was looking for a brilliant developer now it took us freaking ages before we yeah. got a chance to work with you and every single project that came along i was like i need to work with geared app because they yeah. have the same <laughs> values as we have um and lara who is in your team Laura uh, has a visual impairment herself and I was, and my, my background was visual impairment. In fact, my background was guide dogs for the blind. In fact, I have a book. I was doing a presentation on this yeah. earlier today. Well, actually, so I, I have guide dogs on my notes because, yeah. Oh, there we go. So <laughs> this is me as a guide dog mobility instructor uh, standing between um, a chat with his guide dog and a pedestrian crossing box. And then anybody who's noticed or looked in the background, I've actually got a pedestrian crossing here in the background. Um, and that's, that's not because I just need somewhere to hang my coat and I'm ostentatious. It's because I, amazingly, as a guide dog mobility instructor, I invented the world's first pedestrian crossing operated by smartphones. So yeah. if you can't find a button, if you can't reach a button, if you're a wheelchair user, if you're a visually impaired person, if you're somebody who just doesn't, for some reason, want to to make physical contact with a button. I don't know why that would, oh yeah, COVID. Um, so I was thinking, yeah. well, is there a way of actually pressing the button with a smartphone? And the reason that I was thinking about smartphones because back in 2006, people were turning up to train with guide dogs back when I was with the organization and they were using, they were using uh, Apple and they were using use inclusion characters, words, speaking volume, head volume, Speaking yeah. rate Now most most visually impaired people I know use it like that. Because yeah. they, they hear it. And I was just like, wow, my clients were turning up to use this stuff. And I was thinking, wouldn't it be good if the mobile phone and, and associated technology could actually be used to solve some of the problems they were living with? And the pedestrian crossing was the obvious one. I just went, I wonder if a mobile phone could press a button at a crossing. And yeah. Then I just surrounded myself with people who could actually make that happen. The idea is the person who comes up with the idea doesn't have to be able to build a company or learn how to build a company. They can learn how to build a company, but <laughs> they don't have to be a developer. They don't have to be a software no. engineer or a hardware engineer. They need those people around them, which is why we started talking way back in the day. Yeah. Um, and uh, when you were in short trousers, you're probably in short trousers. Short trousers and a cap. I'm, I'm actually cap, I'm wearing man. joggers. And bit business up top. <laughs> but I was presenting earlier, so I had to have a shirt on. But yeah. um, yeah, where's your hat, man? You used to wear hats. I know time. it is actually. It's your. That's got it. Yeah, it couldn't be too far away. That has. I mean, that's you. That's you. That. That's like, yeah, now I know well, who you are. Yeah, I, I only. Go. I thought you had a ginger beard, but didn't have ginger hair. I just thought. No. <laughs> There you go. Uh, so I had, I had invented this thing while I was for guide dog, working for Guide Dogs of the Blind. And then I was like, oh, Jesus, nobody else is doing it. It was the first in the world. And I just thought, well, I'm going to have to leave Guide Dogs in order to do stuff with it. 
And then, I mean, I originally thought it was going to be a social enterprise or a charity or something, but then I realized that I needed to get investment. And then I, I thought, well, grant funding's out there for a social investment or a social enterprise. But then if you do the grant funding, well, the grant funding is generally speaking, not set you doing what you want to do. It's you doing what they want you to do in order to tick all the boxes. And the truth is that I was doing something totally innovative that nobody had ever done before. So nobody had put out a call on Innovate UK for who can come up with a uh, pedestrian crossing that's operated by smartphones because nobody knew it was a problem. Yeah. So I had to follow my own path or whatever it was called, or follow my own whatever. Anyway, like, so like I had to do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so that's what I had to do. Uh, and brought a couple of people into my company, put all my own money, sold my house. This is rented, this place. So I, I no longer own anything in my life. It's all rented stuff and I got rid of everything but we're now in a situation where we've got two fantastic products that are really starting to take off under the heading of tech for good which yes. is the chat which yes. is why you're chatting That's to here. me today it's funny there's a, there's a few things that you mentioned there you know um with that picture of you with the gap with the the button and it was actually the button app was what first got us talking I think we met mm -hmm. at eTag or we do um, yeah. And it's funny now I was down the street for the first time in ages the other day and uh, I saw those buttons that now the pedestrian buttons are no longer in use between 7am and 9pm because yeah. of COVID. So uh, they're all automatic. Um, yeah. Do you know how, how has that affected um, the visually impaired community? Well, so there's lots of reasons why that's a good idea and there's lots of reasons why it's a bad idea. Yeah. So if we think about the traffic for a start, if you come up to a crossing, and let's say it's a, just a single traffic, a single road with one crossing over it. And it comes on, it goes on to green for the, for you. And then it goes on to red and then you stop and there's nobody standing on either side of the road. And you look either side of the road and you go, there's nobody there. And you think, I'm not going to sit here for the next 30 seconds. And you're tempted to go through it. That's a downside of having that yeah. system. The great thing about it is that you can get up to that crossing and instead of having to press the button with your finger, this is for everybody, you know that you just have to wait a couple of minutes and then it will turn green and then you cross, which is yeah. great. If you're visually impaired, not pressing the button is really useful. However, when you're visually impaired, you end up, you do this. Yeah, so you've... You're touching the whole thing. You're touching mm -hmm. the whole thing. So it's not just about the button. It's actually use it as a uh, orientation well, aid. So, as yeah, yeah, you position yourself. And especially if there's not tactile pavement and so on to accompany. Yeah, and there should be tactile paving. This isn't the standard. But underneath the crossing is a tactile cone. And you won't see it. But yeah, it rotates, doesn't it? Yeah. That's my fingernail on the tactile cone. And that rotates. So all those crossings that have been put on autom automatic with no audible signal, you don't know the green man is on. So mm. if you are blind and you get to that crossing, you don't know when to cross. So you have to use the tactile cone, which yeah. is a tactile cone at a time when we're told don't press buttons. Yeah. So that is where it became this suddenly bloody hell. Well, we're actually not doing anything that's gonna help people here. But the other day, cause it can be helpful, um, but it's just, it's not gonna last forever because mm -hmm. if we go back to that first one again, the more traffic on the road, the more we're gonna jam up the entire city. If we get to a crossing, there's nobody crossing it and, and it's, it's all red. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's definitely, it's worthy of discussion. But yeah. uh, it's quite challenging. There's no challenging. simple solution. Well, the solution no. would be to install the uh, button, would it not? Well, that's a, I, I'm never of the opinion that, I mean, yeah, it'd be great to go, yeah, our solution is a solution for everything. But the truth is that you have to compromise in every single area. The, the greatest solution in the world is a compromise. Mm -hmm. um, because no one solution is going to fit absolutely everything. Uh, yeah. So you could install button, but then you've got a situation where, what if somebody doesn't have their phone? What if their phone's battery is dead? And then you're yeah. kind of like, well, I can't use that. What's so the you have to think of lots of different yeah. ways. Yeah. How much redundancy do you introduce? <laughs> well, that, that's it. The thing with button was that um, we were pressing the button purely by getting close to the crossing. We would then press the button, which for somebody who can't lift their hand off their power chair, brilliant. They can now cross the road and independently, which is obviously a fantastic thing for them to be able to do. And it, so pre-COVID, we were still providing solutions for people. We were turning on audible signals where they'd been turned off. We were increasing crossing times for people if they got to a crossing and they needed a little bit longer. So we could actually increase that crossing time. Mm -hmm. So we're personalizing pedestrian crossings. You think about traffic in cities. Um, 
the traffic in a city is only recently, really, the last 70, 80 years has the person been involved in that at all. Because if you go back two or 300 years ago where there was no cars, it was horses. Yeah. And if you just walked out, you couldn't stop a horse going through a town. You'd get run over if you walked out. And nobody's yeah. going to be very happy if you step out and go, you need to stop now. Be like, mm -hmm. you're getting, this is the King's Highway, you know, or the Queen's yeah. Highway. Get out of the way. So, of course, it's just carried on from that. But in cities, pedestrians need to take control again. Yeah. And I, I love it when you have um, the rugby at somewhere like Murrayfield. Uh, when everybody gets chucked out, or after Easter Road or wherever it might be, mm -hmm. everybody gets chucked out, and the, the road, just... road is taken over by humans. And the yeah. cars are just edging their way through. Well, that is, I, I love that. It's like recapturing the streets and making it. Well, it's kind of like what Bristol did with closing, closing their city center to, uh, to cars. Is it, is it Bristol? I think it is, and over the weekends, the entire city center is closed to cars and it's entirely pedestrianized. Yeah, see that, I, I really like that idea. As long as when they design the streets, they design it so that the clues that a blind person can use are still there. So if you do shared streets, which is where everything's flat, the pavement mm. and the road are flat and cars share that environment with the car and the pedestrian, well, mm -hmm. car drivers don't, if you go 50-50 between a pedestrian and a, and a car, the pedestrian is much more squishy. And yeah. when they hit each other, pedestrian suffers. If you hit an old lady in a car, even if you're going two miles an hour, there's a very good chance you're gonna break something and she's probably going to be in hospital and may even die from whatever, she, whatever that causes. So it, it's not an easy thing. And yes, yeah. it's great if we install button. And the truth is that just this last week, we installed through the whole town of Irvine. So Irvine, every single pedestrian crossing in Irvine is operated by smartphones oh, now. Oh, cool. Yeah. First in the world. <laughs> yeah. So um, before you, we, you, we kind of, we kind of I think we've been before we started recording, but we touched on, on compromise. Um, so as a tech for good company, and we'll maybe talk about what you believe tech for good is in a minute, but how do you compromise um, and make do that decision making to achieve a solution that um, will benefit the majority when the product is meant for the for a minority in itself? Well, that's a really good question. How, how are we how are the majority benefiting? Well, if you think about the minority and majority in this situation, every single person on this planet is going to be old unless yeah. they die very quickly. So it is the largest minority in the world because it actually encapsulates everybody. <laughs> so when you think about disability and age, we are all going to be disabled and elderly. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, we can call it minority, uh, although it is 20% of the world's population. Um, it's 1.3 billion people. It's 13, sorry, it's 13 million people in the UK alone. Uh, it's, it's a lot of people. Uh, the spending power uh, of disabled people in the UK is 249 billion pounds a year. I mean, it's insane. It's 8 trillion worldwide. So yeah. we can call it a minority, but the truth is it's the largest minority because it makes up pretty much everybody that's on the planet. <laughs> so, so, but how, how do you, I'm just trying to think, so for example, if we, if we look at, at Button and you had yeah. um, the power, power chair user um, and you have a visual impaired user, um, and you, you maybe also have hard of hearing. There's also yeah, there's, yeah. there's lots in, bet in between and beyond. How mm. do you how did you approach designing a solution? Uh, well, yeah. The, the truth is that I designed it for visually impaired people, and then when oh, this would be really because that's what that's what you knew. Yeah, because that's when that was my area. I had 18 years training guide dogs and and people how to use them. So I knew visual impairment really really well. And then somebody said, well, that would be really good for somebody in a wheelchair. And I went, oh, yeah, yeah, it would, wouldn't it? <laughs> and I think this was the key, uh, and it really was a key, because when I started Neatbox, I had no idea about business. I really didn't have a clue. And I had no idea about sustainability. And I had no idea about, I was just thinking about visual impairment. But, of course, if you're providing a solution for, let's say, the U.K., and you turn up and you say, this is a solution for the UK and this is going to be perfect for 300,000 people in the United Kingdom. Uh, and of that, 5,000 of them are guide dog owners. There are only 5,000 guide dog owners in the UK. 5,000, that's it. Out of 13 million disabled people, only 5,000 of them are guide dog owners. If you provide a solution just for guide dog owners and you say it's going to cost this much and it is just a solution for them, 
you have not got a sustainable business model because the company that's paying for it is going to go, what's my ROI here? What's my price per person? What's mm-hmm. my bang for my buck? But if you can make a product that actually covers loads of people, everybody yep. with a mobility yep. impairment, um, and then you find a situation where, well, everybody with a mobility impairment, well, what's a mobility impairment? Well, long-term mobility impairment, wheelchair user potentially, but short-term mobility impairment can be person with broken arm or person with broken leg using a wheelchair. And then you've got a temporary um, person with a mobility impairment, a parent with a double buggy. And that buggy is already three foot in front of them, two foot in front Mm -hmm. of them. When they get to that crossing to press the button, which is going to be quite close to the road, they're you, 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 you do be... you see parents they spin they have to spin the pram around to the side but if there's That's other it. people waiting to use the crossing yeah well if you've got that that little kiddie's legs their toes are pointing into the road where there's a car going past what parent wants to put their toddler's feet in front of a car so we're starting we're now looking at a solution that actually crosses not just the demographic of disability but also people carrying things people, uh, well, COVID-19. And then when you look at it, you go, right, okay, how else can we use this tech? So this is a button press on a mobile phone. How many other things do we press in our our life? Um, Doors, disability access doors. You come up to a disability access door and you've got to find the blue button with the wheelchair user on it. You've got to find that and then you've got to press it. Well, actually, um, none of us want to open doors anymore. Mm -hmm. Have you been through a door where you've gone up to it and gone, yeah, no worries, and just flesh on metal handle, pulled it towards you and walked well, through? I've got an going... inherent fear of getting a static shock, so I kind of refuse. <laughs> <laughs> well, brilliant. You, were, you had a, a COVID-19 solution in place yeah. already, which was just shoulder barge through doors. <laughs> uh, but for somebody coming up to door, we've now got a solution where we're going to be installing one in London soon. I can't tell you where yet because it's up to them to tell us, but um, it's pretty much the centre. Um, and we're installing a pedestrian crossing, uh, sorry, a, a door operated by smartphones. Uh, oh. So you approach the door and then you walk through the door. So what we were finding was, how do you make something sustainable? And when it's tech for good, how can you actually explain to people that this isn't, now there'll be people out there who make marmalade and scarves, okay? And they might have a social enterprise that does it. And I love marmalade. And when I've got a cold neck, I want a scarf. But that is not a company that is going to take over the world. Who knows? It might be. It might be then the next biggest brand of golden shred or something like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Whatever it might be, or scarves. But but that is potentially a great example of a social good company that is social enterprise, maybe social good. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's great. But if we're going to get investment other than grant funding, if we're going to have a limited company rather than a social enterprise, we need to prove that that company can make an absolute bloody fortune. Mm -hmm. Now, in the past, companies that have made an absolute bloody fortune out of a disability-centric product have made their fortune from the disabled person. The disabled person has bought and has spent something in order to have an item that has made their lives a bit easier. Yes. Now, that equates to a tax on disability. So for me, it was the mission was to provide a service which cost the disabled person zero. So all our apps are free. You don't pay for our apps. You don't get, we don't do advertising on the apps. We don't mine data. We don't need credit cards and all that kind of stuff. But we needed to find a model that made it so that the actual business or the council paid for it. Now, button is the pedestrian crossing. Welcome is customer service. Um, so in a situation where somebody's, disabled they're going to a particular building let's say it's edinburgh airport within 300 meters of the airport their phone sends a message to the customer service team to say gavin is just about to walk through the door gavin's a chap living with autism and here is how you should interact with gavin based on his proximity now that is staff training based on proximity and we launched that in 2018 and lo and behold first company in the world to do it Nobody had ever done staff training based on your proximity to the building. Yeah. Now, the and to model your specific right. requirements as well. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when you, when you first um, mentioned it to me, uh, a really good example was somebody who was um, visually impaired or had a scooter and they were going to a supermarket, for example. And as a case of how, how can we assist you 
because you have your own way that you do things and or how you like to do things and you want to complement that not compromise that <laughs> 100 compliment not compromise i love that i might be using yeah. that one so that's cool. <laughs> but it's true and most people go they've got, they've got a guide dog therefore i need to do this this and this because i was trained two weeks ago about how to do that mm -hmm. but they might also have autism they might also yeah. have acquired brain injury and there's an increased chance they might have uh, a secondary condition. So you might go in there and do the wrong thing, even though you think you're doing the right thing. But yeah. the, the, that famous quote from Henry Ford, which was, uh, if I'd asked them what they'd have wanted, they'd have said faster horses. He didn't say <laughs> it apparently, but there's no proof he said it. But <laughs> if you say to somebody, your staff aren't good enough, or I was treated badly, they will say more staff training. They won't yeah. say, oh, let's put in proximity aware technology that doesn't exist yet. Yeah. Uh, and that's what Welcome did. But the point being, which was the original question, which was, how do you make that sustainable? Or how is that something that you then use? And then I talked about investors. Now, if my company can make an absolute fortune out of something that helps the disabled person for free and is paid for by the business, but in a small monthly subscription, like a SaaS model, mm -hmm. and the business makes more money because they have it in place and they get more people through the door, and they tick all the CSR, but beyond that, they act as uh, corporate social responsibility boxes, but they also start providing better service and have more uh, loyal customers. customers. Yeah. yeah. And beyond that, even more, uh, their staff are now more uh, interested in being customer service for life because they get a buzz every time they give good customer service. Well, then you've got not just tech for good or social good, but high growth tech for good and social good. Yeah. And that's where, and we're going to prove this, I freaking swear it. When, when investors start making money out of my company, when my company is sold, investors across the country will be looking for tech for good business models that make money for everybody or help everybody. If I can do that, other people can do it. Yeah. Um, and that's what we need. We need, and as much as I love them, as much as I love, um, high-end petrochemicals and high-end military hardware. I don't love hardware. <laughs> but as much as I love gin, I do enjoy gin. Yeah. We need our investors to be a little bit more sophisticated in what's next. Yeah. I understand investors want to look for the things that are doing really well now. Like people will get onto the housing market uh, and then the housing market bursts. Yeah. And the, late, the later, less sophisticated investors have got into it thinking they'll make money and then gone. But the early investors, great, make your money, guys. Cool. Yeah. But make money out of the companies that are actually doing good. Yeah. Well, that's kind of like I, I've seen a, a bit of a shift. It's not maybe not fast enough, but like for energy, for example, um, and sustainable energy and green energy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're starting to see like the big companies now you know, they're, they're shutting down their oil rigs and they're stopping coal mining because it's not the future. And it's, it's not been the future for, for too long. But, you know, you need to get out and ahead of this. And where we're going with, uh, with batteries, the next thing is, okay, how can, we, how can we produce batteries that don't require lithium? Yeah. So it's like, okay, how, how, do, we, yeah, how do we encourage uh, innovation in areas that aren't currently, or cobalt, sorry, not lithium and batteries, cobalt, um, is it? Um, how do we encourage innovation in things that we don't realize require innovation? And I think that's, yes, yes. that's really interesting that you kind of highlight that. Yeah, well, I think and I'm a great example of a practitioner who saw a problem because they lived it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we far too often, we rely on academia to solve problems when academia doesn't necessarily know the problem. Yes. And that's a real challenge. Academia ha plays a very important role in this because you get fresh young minds who are going brilliant. No, I can do that. Let's do it. Let's go. Let's do it. Uncynical. But if you want to ask, uh, if, if you want to find out how to run a ward in a hospital better, do you ask somebody in a university how it could be better? Or do you ask the nurse who lives in every day? Or did you ask the patient? Well, yeah. the majority of academia will go and ask the patient as to the actual experience they had yeah. who's the users they're, they're the users they won't necessarily go and ask the nurse and there's a good reason for that is because the majority of nurses would be like 
oh, come on, rip it all out. This is not how I would do it. <laughs> well, leave me alone or whatever. But but there will be nurses out there who are going for years. I've been suggesting improvements because I've spent twenty years in this industry and I've always seen where it's gone wrong. And I've always been ignored. I've never had the, the suggestions box has never been particularly useful for me because as soon as I put it in, it gets taken by somebody else who doesn't actually understand it. But if you take the nurse, the patient, the academic, the software developer, the hardware developer, uh, the entrepreneur, and you put them all in a room uh, and you say, right, guys. And you also say, let's put a balance of importance on who is important at this initial stage mm -hmm. and the people at the initial stage are the end user and the practitioner or the subject matter expert and everybody else needs to go we're listening now that listening can be six months it can be 12 years it can be three days but if it's not listening it's not going to yeah. actually come up with the solutions so, so you just described the google design sprint um really? so yeah so that's what um i was a couple of guys i think it's google ventures they came up with this idea and um, they had a few anecdotes. I've just read their read the book, and um, they, one of the things was this, uh, designing robots for uh, hotels. And it was a case of, uh, or actually, that's not the best example. The best example was uh, coffee. Um, and how how can this uh, coffee chain sell more coffee? Um, it's like a really specialised, high high knowledge people who are enthusiasts. Um, how can they sell more coffee? And it was a case of they're rebuilding their website, and um, it was just about okay, who who's going to buy the coffee? So they got the customers. Who sells the coffee? Who knows about it? And then so you have like the coffee expert, and um, and it was like just actually listening and asking them about how does this? How do you sell coffee? How typically? And um, so it was all about how do you break down the barriers? Because a lot of people, the guy was explaining, well unless you're really into coffee, you don't really know about how, how many grams it should be or what type of bean you like. You just say, I like coffee. And so they uh, sort of like devised this way of, of speaking to people and asking them questions to determine what co sort of coffee they would like. And uh, it was interesting. They kind of just applied this to their website uh, in a really rough prototype. And a couple of days later, they like, tested it and went, okay. So really, it was just a series of questions and they were like, this is a coffee for you. Uh, but it was a case of let's get the the practitioner and the customer or the user, depending on this circumstance, in the same room and have them interact and then have the other experts, the technical experts, you know, weigh in on what's possible, what's not possible and let them all kind of meld together. Well, and I, I love Google and, and I'm not going to instantly disagree with them at all, but I'd like to add something to it. Uh, and I think this is really important to add, especially right now. Um, they found a really great design sprint there where they're going to wait, wait, this is how we get the best out of the people that we need to ask about how we can help them. Mm -hmm. And they went, that, this is the best we can do to get that out of that person. Now, let's not talk about coffee. Let's change the analogy yeah. to designing something for a disabled person. Yeah. Okay. Now you can spend, you can say, right, let's engage with a disabled person and find out what they need. Uh, or let's say we can shadow them for six months brilliant we're gonna know what they need or we could say find somebody who trains disabled people um, with mobility say for instance or whatever it might be and bring them into our organization which was where i was a couple of years ago and that's brilliant because that's really really important it could be the coffee guy the barista who's going i'd love to work for google right let's go and work for google yeah. but what about employing disabled people within your company so that actually the people who are devising it already understand the problem instead of saying the people who are the experts are on the outside let's go and ask them bring, bring the them. experts into your company now there is a whole world in fact half of um working aged adults who are disabled half of them are in employment which is a fractional in comparison to able-bodied adults working age adults so there is a massive mine of disabled people out there who might be software developers, they might be well, anything, financial whiz kids, whatever. Well, bring them into your company. You're going to get so much more than a developer. You're yeah. going to get somebody who goes, yeah, no, that's not what I would choose. I would, that's not going to be any use to me. Why wouldn't we do blah, blah, blah. And it's just one person. But if your company reflects society, 20% of your company will be disabled people yeah. uh, in some way. Uh, so 
I, I think we need to take that sprint and take it one step further, which is don't think of the user as somebody else. Mm -hmm. Actually, in, embrace them. So that's an, it's an interesting point because, um, yeah, if you, but if you're a large company uh, or any company, really, you should you know uh, bring these people in house and and learn directly from them and have them lead effectively these discussions. But so I was chatting to uh, Jeremy from PAL before and mm -hmm. he's going through the B Corp certification. And right. um, he's like, well, it's really hard. I'm a, I'm a two person, no, 2.5 person business. So when they're talking about, um, uh, his example was about like the recycling um, and like, where do you get your energy from? But we'd gone, th we'd con gone through it as well. And it was like, do you have um, motion sensor lights uh, in your bathroom? And I was like, well, this stuff doesn't really apply to us. We just switch, let's switch the light off ourselves. Uh, and he'd say, how can we have diversity in a company of two people? Um, so we talk about, you know, bringing people in house and, and kind of doing all these things, but how do you achieve that when you're a micro business? You make a uh, statement. And, pardon? You make a statement. Yeah. <laughs> you make a statement. You say, this is what we are going to do. So I did a, I made a statement. I made a pledge um, three years ago, four years ago, something like that, three years which was employ 20, hashtag employ 20. 20% of my company will be either disabled or directly linked to disability. Uh, so 20% of my company will be directly connected to disability. Now, um, Caro, who's our um, ops director, she, or operations manager, her children are autistic, or one of them's autistic, they're on ADHD, and she understands it. We yeah. bring her in and she reads, she truly understands it, but we make that pledge yeah. and it doesn't matter how big you are. What you do is you go, right, we've made a pledge. Now we're going to make sure because that right. pledge follows it. You go, right, we're advertising for somebody. Let's advertise. And you might not get that person, but your pledge means that when you look at your applications that you put out there, you, you go, or your job specs, you go, have we been discriminatory in how we've said this? It's funny. So when <sighs> We've had um, ah, sometimes a hard time when it comes to employing because, and I didn't even realize this, um, is that we, c we can try to be inclusive and in the pro uh, process of doing that, we can be exclusive, <laughs> exclusivatory. Uh, um, yeah. And so like, for example, we, we want to hire more female developers or just more female team members to increase the diversity. Um, and it turns out that the way that we were writing our job adverts were turning women off because um, apparently if you list a whole series of requirements, a woman is more likely to say, well, I don't fit this bill, I'm not going to bother. Whereas a man is more likely um, to say, well, I could probably do that. <laughs> yeah, so, I've heard that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a bit more gun ho So it was a case of how can we change our language to be softer um, so that we aren't making so many assumptions and so that we get to attract the widest gamut of people because ultimately that's we want to attract the best person uh, and how you know you can't single people out we don't want to focus on any one particular type or, or creed we just want to attract the best people and it's just a case strip away everything else so it was, it's really interesting there's so many little things that you can do yeah and uh, so, yeah, it's a, it's a main Microsoft, uh, I can't, I've not, I have used it in the past when it was demoed to me, but Microsoft have got uh, a function within, um, my, within their software where it can look over your letter and work out if you have been biased, gender biased or disability <laughs> biased. And it actually, it goes through it and said, you could use this word instead because that's inclining somebody to be of a particular gender when they're reading it. And you just go, wow, that's amazing. But I think, and I think this is, a, this is the same for any discrimination, is mm. if you worry about it and keep your head in the sand and just don't address it, then you're, that's even worse than, not, than getting it wrong, doing it and getting it wrong. I think, and I've always said this to people, don't worry about saying the wrong words to a disabled person. Yeah. Worry about having the wrong attitude in the heart behind the words. Yeah. Uh, so if somebody says, do you see what I mean? Don't go, oh my God, of course they don't see what I mean. They're blind. Well, you'd say that to somebody who's sighted on the phone. You see what I mean? No, I don't because yeah. I'm on a phone. But you, if you know that it's coming from the right place, don't get too frightened by it. 
you are yeah. going to upset somebody sooner or later, but you know it came from the right place. Just yeah. don't be too afraid of it. Embrace it. Take it on the chin when you get it wrong and be honest and say, we're just trying to get it right. And we want to get yeah. it right. Yeah. Please help us get it right. Yeah, be, be an ally effectively was, is, yeah. is something that's quite often said. And it's true. It's like, it's open, it's like presenting yourself as someone who's open to, to learn and, um, and iterate and improve. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and so it's just been been open to it, you know, and, and humble, uh, and yeah. going. I don't know everything, but that's not the history of mankind. And I, I use that <laughs> word advisedly, but yeah. it's generally men in the past who have gone out and found people, and and then it, they've kind of produced that. And it's 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 a self fulfilling prophecy that when a man looks for somebody, they're looking for the things that you've just explained there that they're going to use the wrong language, blah blah blah. So you make sure that the people who are looking for people are the people that you want to be employing. So it's not easy, uh, and people will make mistakes. But if you're doing it with the right heart at least you'll know within yourself that you're trying to get it right, but don't be yeah. frozen. Don't be like a rabbit in headlights. You've just got to embrace and it. Don't use it as an excuse not to do it in the first place. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I heard that from a, a retailer once who said, yeah, but if I put in a ramp, then somebody might come in and complain that I haven't got a toilet, an accessible toilet. You go, well, <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> it's not mutually exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> just, oh, you're going, oh, come on. Just, it's okay. Make an effort, make an effort because people will appreciate the effort. It, it's yeah. more about managing expectations. If you knew you could go to a, a particular shop, uh, but you knew there wasn't an accessible toilet within that shop, you would then make the decision as to whether you were going to that shop or not uh, based on that. But mm -hmm. you're definitely not going if you can't get in. At least if you manage the person's expectations, they decide whether they're going or not. Yeah, I went to the toilet before. I'm going to that shop now. I know I can't use the toilet in there, but I went to a toilet but, around the corner yeah. and now I can go to that particular shop. Yeah. Or yeah. coffee shop or whatever it might be. Wow. <laughs> so um, is there anything like, it's, a, it's too big a question, but really what I was wondering next is, how would you, so we talked about the, the marmalade and the scarf company, the potentially social enterprises, they're, do, they're doing good, they're doing their good in their own way. How, how does Joe Bloggs business that's just, your, your normal average business, how do they embrace tech for good? And sh should they? And what, what does that mean to you? Because for me, tech for good isn't one singular thing. It's kind of, as we discussed, it's an approach. It's a, it's a, it's a, a way to kind of, absorb things or listen and just kind of to act and be so is it is there anything that you could say to other businesses that they could do to uh, embrace it so i've never and i've just you've just kind of made me go bloody hell i've never really thought about <laughs> what tech for good is to other people i could only ever really say what tech for good is for me mm -hmm. um i could take a rough guess of what, what it is for other people but i know what it isn't it isn't um, I have a technological solution and I make sure that 20% of my profits go to uh, whatever it might be in India yeah. or something That's, like that. That's yeah. not tech for you. You can't call missiles tech for good just because you give 20% of your profit to or landmines or whatever it might be. That's not yeah. tech for good. I believe that the technology that you're, if it is tech that you're doing, the tech has to have a purpose which is uh, beneficial to the planet in some way or some subsection of the planet whilst at the same time isn't negative towards the planet or another subsection of the planet so it's no use saying this is absolutely brilliant for them <laughs> but if they're gonna yeah, but screw these it. guys yeah yeah uh, and tech for i i believe that doing stuff for good irrelevant of whether it's tech or whatever it might be doing stuff for good and making it financially no, making it more than financially viable. Financially viable is great. Having a company that can, that can pay wages to staff, doesn't necessarily grow, stays in one place and provides jobs for people for the next 20 years, but never grows, brilliant. That's absolutely fine. You're not going to get loads and loads of investment. You might get low investment at the start and then you just get to a stage and then you, yeah. you're putting something in. But when you have a, a solution that is truly high uh, high value and high growth and it does good and the best example I've ever thought of was that young 17 year old fella that came up with a way of cleaning the ocean of plastic yes. by having that thing yeah. and you go that is tech for good 
he's actually removing the plastic that's in the sea. And I, I haven't seen it for a couple of years. I need to check up and see how he's getting on. But that is tech for good. What investor wouldn't want to invest in that company? Because yeah. people are going to go, yeah, you're cleaning the governments are going to pay you to clean the world of plastic. You are going to become wealthy. I mean, I don't think you should take the piss here. I don't think you should become yeah. wealthy within... We, we, Gone are the days, surely, where somebody, where was it, the, the top 1% have got 90% of the wealth in America and they will never spend the money they've got in their bank account. And all they do is just buy another luxury yacht. Uh, we, these guys have got to be ostracized. No decent-minded society can look at that expenditure and go, yeah, but you're giving people jobs by m buying super yachts. Yeah, that's not tr trickle-down like economics. It's, so that's another not. subject. And us younger folk, <laughs> us, I'm, I'm younger because I started a company when I was 40. <laughs> um, but us people that look in the, at the world with fresh eyes and say, that's not the future. Anybody who's got children is going, oh my God, their children are turning around and going, what did you do? Yeah. Why is it like this now? And those guys who are 18, 19, 20, the guys that you're employing, guys and girls that you're employing, they're the ones that are saying, no, actually, my attitude towards the world is slightly different. What we have to try and do, and I think I truly believe this, we have to make sure that they don't become tarnished as they get older. Because as people get older, they go, I want a car. I want three holidays abroad a year. I want to make sure that I've got my retirement and all the rest of it. And I want a super yacht when I'm a multimillionaire. And I don't care about other people. That's what happens. Humans, as they get older, they become less vision-led and they become more personally and materialistically led because they've got children yeah. and families and mortgages and all the rest of it. We need to try and humans need to try and maintain some connection Hunger for change. To, yeah. Change positive change for good. And if you can yeah. maintain that, it, these guys exist. You'll find people. Well, I'm, I'm that guy. I'm 52 years old. I exist. I want the world to be better. I want to pay my taxes. I want to be super taxed. I want to get to a stage where my company is going, you need to pay 75% tax because the money I get, is going to be enough for me and the people around me and my investors and the rest of it. it, it we need to do better. We also need to take a, um, responsibility for when we are taking advantage of our society. We need to go, yeah, do you know what? I haven't worked a day in my life and I don't care about that because somebody's just gonna pay for everything. Well, we need to find ways to help that person out of that mindset and make yeah. sure that they also become a member of society, be they disabled or, um, I can't think of a politically correct word. They, they just haven't have been educated in the way that maybe yeah. that has been enlightened in that way. They need mentors yeah. and vision models and yeah, you know. It's a whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, that was awesome. Um, <laughs> cool. So I don't actually have any other guests lined up. I have a few people that I have in mind. But if anyone, Gavin, or anyone who's hopefully watching this um, would like to take part or would know somebody who might be interested in taking part, then I am open to hearing. Uh, you can just reach me via our website at geodap.co.uk. Um, and yeah, let's keep going on this mission for tech for good. You're starting a great thing here, Josh, and I would come back every week if I could, but I'll certainly be coming back and watching what you're doing um, because it's really important. And Scotland is the place that this can happen. Yeah. It's the driver for change and it's interesting because when we were kind of talking about what we wanted the series to be i really wanted just to have conversations with people and kind of see where it went there's not really an agenda and i think it's really interesting it gives me a chance to learn more about these other businesses um that are embodying values that i share uh, yeah. or that we share at geared app um so thank you very much for your time it's been a pleasure to catch up Namaste, um, my friend. Yeah, hopefully soon we can uh, bump elbows and <laughs> share a pint. <laughs> I, think, I think it's more getting a glass and doing that. I yeah. mean, that's be, and there's no physical contact. It's just we'll go back to yeah. jobs and we'll, that'll be fine. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much, Gavin. I'll speak to you in a bit. Cheers, man. Cheers.